So we learned from the previous video that prokaryotes are microorganisms. They're extremely small. They are teeny tiny. They are microscopic. And even so, they are the dominant form of life on this planet. If we were to take all of these microorganisms and collect their biomass, their biomass would be greater than all of the animals on the planet right now, maybe even all of the plants too. They are the most diverse set of organisms existing in almost every single environment, those you can think of and some of them you can't even imagine. In fact, it's thought that we've classified less than 1% of all of these organisms on this planet right now. And their diverse set of environments not only include living on living things, but also living in other living things. In fact, in and on you right now, there might be more bacteria than there are cells in your body. And we're talking about tens, maybe even hundreds of trillions of bacteria. Does that gross you out? Well, it shouldn't. Because as I said, these are the dominant form of life on this planet, not only for themselves, but also for other living things as well. In fact, without these microorganisms, you and I probably wouldn't be here. Now, when people hear the word bacteria, there's generally a negative association with that term, much like when you hear the word virus, a small particle that I can't see that can potentially make me sick. And certainly there is some validity to that. If we think about things like cholera, or tuberculosis, or salmonella, these bacteria are pathogenic. They can and will make you sick. But we need to understand that there are some beneficial aspects to bacteria as well. Some so crucial that without them, that life on this planet as we know it would cease to exist without their presence. There are some bacteria, certainly as we understand, that are decomposers that break things down, that without which all of the nutrients that are locked up in organic matter wouldn't get back into the various cycles that need them. Speaking of cycles, there are some bacteria that are involved in the nitrogen cycle that fix nitrogen, that without these bacteria, we would not be able to take the nitrogen that exists in the air around us and get it into our bodies where it's needed. There are massive amounts of bacteria, especially aquatic bacteria, that is bacteria that's found in water and in the oceans in particular, that are photosynthetic, that take massive amounts of carbon dioxide out of the air and produce equally massive amounts of oxygen. We have many bacteria that are mutualistic, that exist within the guts and intestines of living things that help them break down, that they wouldn't be able to break down otherwise, or certainly wouldn't be able to break down as fast. We utilize bacteria in food, whether it be through the fermentation of, say, alcoholic beverages, or whether it be in the production of cheeses or yogurts or various other products. So if we just couple this short list of ways in which bacteria are beneficial to humans with the ways in which they are not beneficial, that is pathogenic to humans, I think it's fairly obvious that bacteria then must be a fairly diverse set of organisms, and certainly they are. If we just take a look at some of the characteristics and the way that they're classified, we can see that there is a wide array of bacteria, at least the bacteria that we know and have classified up until this point. And there's several different criteria or ways that we use to classify these bacteria. And most of them are just based on observable characteristics or behaviors. But if we take a look at a general representation, we can see that, first and foremost, there's some form of genetic material that is surrounded by a cell wall. Now this cell wall is a peptidoglycan cell wall, and depending on the nature of this cell wall, we can classify these organisms as to whether or not they take something called a gram stain. And then depending on the nature of the cell wall, these bacteria are either gram negative or gram positive. Now some bacteria possess a flagellum, which itself kind of moves around and allows the bacteria to move from place to place. They contain a pilus or pili, which allow them to adhere or bind to a particular substrate, and in some cases allow them to exchange genetic information through sexual reproduction. Now, many of these bacteria have a capsule, which is a form of protection and prevents the bacteria from drying out, or at least allows them to exist for an extended period of time in an unfavorable environment. Now, in addition to, or sometimes in place of this capsule, some bacteria are able to develop an endospore, which forms around the chromosome when the cell is under stress, protecting the bacteria until more favorable conditions are available. Now, a number of bacteria that we know that we associate with disease, like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus and Streptobacillus, these are organisms, bacteria, that are classified based on shape. And I think if you look at this, you're going to recognize some of the groupings that we have in here from their name. 
So if we think about something like staph, a staph infection, or staphylococcus, the staph refers to a grouping of bacteria, much like a group of grapes. So when we think about staphylococcus, we think about a group of spherical or circular bacteria that are grouped together. And if we see something like streptobacillus, you would see that they are in a line and they are bacillus or rod-shaped. So in addition to the nature of the cell wall or the shape of the bacteria, bacteria can sometimes be classified or categorized based on the way that they acquire food. We have photosynthetic bacteria, that is autotrophic bacteria, and there are heterotrophic bacteria, bacteria that rely on other organic matter for their source of nutrients or energy. We have some bacteria that are asexual, in fact a number of bacteria are asexual. They go through something called binary fission, where they grow and they duplicate their genetic information, and they duplicate their cellular components, and then they split apart. And they continue to grow and split apart and continue to grow and split apart. Now this asexual reproduction, as we have learned, just ensures that these bacteria are effectively clones of one another. But there are other bacteria that go through sexual reproduction, where there's an exchange of genetic information, or at least part of the genetic information from one bacteria to another. We talked about the pili earlier as part of the structure of bacteria, and so there are instances in which there is a pilus, a sex pilus, that extends between one bacteria to another, kind of like a mid-air fueling of a jet, where genetic information is passed from one organism to another. And so in that way, we have some bacteria that are able to exchange genetic information from one to another. Now, because of bacteria's ability to reproduce rapidly and in massive quantities, uh, its ability in some cases to go through sexual reproduction, in fact, in some cases, bacteria will just take up and incorporate random fragments of genetic information from their environment, it is entirely possible for bacteria to change or mutate rapidly. And as a result, we have to be concerned about this when studying pathogenic bacteria because we have developed something called antibiotics to combat them. Now, if we think about the term antibiotic, anti against biotic, living things, it's important to understand that we have to use this against a certain class of organism. Because as we've already talked about, viruses aren't living things. So we can't prescribe or use antibiotics against viruses. We have to use antivirals. So if we're going to continue to use antibiotics, and I think it's fair to say that we probably will, we have to consider the class of organisms that we're using them to combat against. Bacteria can reproduce and evolve rapidly, and as a result, if we want to continue to utilize these antibiotics effectively, we have to minimize the exposure that the bacteria has to them. This means not misusing, abusing, and overusing these antibiotics, because the more exposure they get, the more likely the bacteria are going to develop a resistance, thus rendering these antibiotics less effective, or in some cases completely ineffective. Now in terms of prokaryotes, I've really only focused on one domain thus far, and those are the eubacteria. Now, as little as we know about the eubacteria, we know even less about this next domain of organisms that we refer to as archaea. Now, previously the archaea and some other organisms were grouped in with the bacteria in a kingdom called monarins. But thanks to DNA analysis and some other criteria, we have found that the archaeans are actually no more related to the bacteria than you or I are related to the bacteria. Now, they're referred to as the archaea because they are archaic, or found in archaic or extremely old environments, that is, environments that are believed to be around since the beginning of the Earth. That is, these archaeans are sometimes referred to as extremophiles because they seem to proliferate in extreme environments. So we have organisms that are found in very high temperatures, that are found in very low temperatures. We have some of these organisms that are found in high salt environments. And we have some of them that are found in environments that have large amounts of methane. So all of these characteristics are believed to be shared with some of the early conditions that existed on this planet. Now, just because their environment is a little bit different, that's not the only distinction between them and bacteria. There's a very different set of genetic information, and there is a very different composition of the cell wall. So even though they are microscopic and are prokaryotic and share that sort of unicellular characteristic with bacteria, they are different enough that they can be classified and are classified in their own domain. An important side note of this is maybe because of some of the extreme environments that they're found in, uh, they haven't been found to be pathogenic to any living thing, at least, at least not yet. 
So yes, the focus in our discussion of prokaryotes was on the eubacteria, not only because it's the domain that we know the most about, but it is definitely the one that most impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis. But what I want you to understand after watching this video is that organisms, even simple microscopic organisms, can have a massive impact on all of the different forms of life on this planet as we know it. And they are worth understanding, and they are worth studying, and they certainly are worth respecting. Thanks for watching.